<laughs> and here we go. Star Trek. Right. So, hello. Uh, we are Simon and Lisa Thomas, uh, better known as To Ride the World. Um, for anyone that doesn't know us, Lisa and I left England in 2003 with a plan to travel on two motorcycles for a year. Surprise, surprise, we ended up traveling around the world uh, for 17 years, fell in love with travel and fell in love with photography. But we're not on the road at the moment. Um, because of the pandemic, uh, we were actually caught uh, at a period of time when we had returned to the UK um, uh, to see family and get a few medical things sorted. And we couldn't leave. Uh, so we are up a mountain in a cabin in Wales. Uh, but it's actually spectacular. We feel very fortunate uh, that we are actually here um, and close to family as well. But today we want to say a big thank you to Overland Expo for giving us an opportunity to share some of our favourite photographs with you, but more importantly, to share the stories behind the photographs. Um, it's very simple to look at an image and go, OK, well, that's very nice. Um, for Lisa and I, every image we've taken and kept is very personal. Um, but we thought some of you might find it interesting to hear what we had to go through to get into some of these locations or why we've taken certain photographs and why they're precious to us. It was actually very difficult to choose the photographs because the ones that I wanted to include always involve Simon doing something really bad or naughty or prancing around half naked and I thought mm, maybe those stories weren't there was, so good. There was, quite, there was quite a lot of choice. Um, Funnily enough, the photographs we've chosen, we've only chosen three or four to share with you uh, because of time, are largely based in Asia, the stands, um, Pakistan, India. Um, one of the first photographs we wanted to talk to you about was a photograph that was really challenging to capture. And it's of uh, a building called the Golden Temple, otherwise known as, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm reading this. Get the pronunciation correct. Hamandir Sahib, which actually means the abode of God. Um, we travelled through Pakistan and our first uh, city stop after crossing the border into India was Amritsar. India for us was overwhelming. Um, we actually had a six month visa we worked very hard to get and after four months Lisa and I were physically and mentally spent and we escaped into the relative sanctuary escaped. of Nepal. That sounds, that sounds interesting. Um, we were already very tired when we got there, but India, India on the bikes was very, very challenging. Um, off mean, the in, bikes. In, India as a, as a country, I mean, it's chaotic, it's colourful, uh, it's frenetic. Um, it, it, it's a fabulous country. Uh, the food is great. It bombards um, the senses 24 yeah. hours a day. Yeah. But what was so interesting is when we got to Amritsar, we knew of the Golden Temple. Um, I think it's one. Well, I think it's the fifth it's largest not, mm. religious site in the world. It's the holiest site for Sikhs. It's, it's open to absolutely everyone. Um, it doesn't matter where you come from. Um, e even though you're in the middle of, of Amritsar, and it, which is a busy, bustling, chaotic city, the moment you enter. Um, the Golden Temple. Um, it, Everything it, changes. Peaceful, so peaceful. I think what threw both of us, um, as we stepped through into the Golden Temple, it was almost like stepping into another world. And suddenly the cacophony of noise that was overwhelming seconds ago suddenly and dramatically changes. Um, there is a huge square pool and in the center sits the Golden Temple itself. Now it isn't just named the Golden Temple to sound romantic. The Golden Temple has 500 kilos of 24 karat gold covering one, it. That's over, that's over 1,000 pounds of 24 karat gold covering the temple. Now the reason the photograph is important to us is that we have seen literally hundreds of photographs of this incredible structure and I'd felt a lot of them were the same. They were very beautiful but typically they were shot in the daylight uh, when you have all the reflections from the pool, you have a blue sky, you have people milling around. What Lita and I wanted to do was capture something different and that was where our challenge began. I think we got up at something like 4.30 in the morning to get along because we wanted to get there uh, when the sun hit 
the temple. Well, this is what sunrise. this is what we hadn't seen. We hadn't seen any images that were really impactful, um, that captured the serenity of the scene, um, and so we came up with this idea of capturing the very first light of a brand new day as it hit the Golden Temple. How hard could that be, we I think, thought? I think I said to Simon, okay, so the sun rises this time, which means we've got to be on the road and getting there. Uh, it, it would take us maybe about 10, 15 minutes to get there from where we were. Um, we have to get on the road at 4.30. <laughs> I'm not going to say what he actually said. <laughs> I'm not a morning person. There was lots of coffee. We got up at 3 o'clock. We found the night before somebody who would cycle us there. Um, walking wasn't an option. Uh, it was it was minus it was zero temperatures in, in a rickshaw, basically. So we have no idea how this works, but it does. Uh, we had to make sure that our... Uh, we had bare feet as a sign of respect. Well, you have to take your shoes off when you enter the temple and cover your head. And that's, not, so, that's not a big deal until you realise... it's February. All, it's February. <laughs> it's before sunrise. It's sub-zero. And you the weren't build, walking on cold marble. marble. We marble. also We also knew from past experience that we had to get permission from somebody to use a tripod. Because of the limited amount of light we were going to be working with, we had to stabilise the camera. You cannot just put a tripod up in almost any religious building in the world. It took us an hour and a half to find anybody that even knew who we should speak to that might be there to give us permission. Mm -hmm. Long story short, we ended up getting permission about nine minutes before sunrise. So where it ended up being about two minutes to spare. We found the location, we worked out where the sun was rising directly behind us, got into position, tried to make sure that as few people were going to be in the shot as Actually, possible. Actually, there weren't many people, surprisingly, at 5 a.m. And then, and then tried to dial in the camera settings, realising that neither of us had brought a torch. So trying to see the settings on the camera and operate the camera Hang was on a Let me challenge. translate flashlight. <laughs> been, been in the UK too long now. But the result itself uh, was far better than we could have imagined. Things worked out great. Uh, we ended up catching the very first rays of sun as the sun rose high enough to crest the outer marble wall of the temple itself and literally bounce off this incredible gold structure. Um, the it was actually a very clear day, which actually meant that surrounding the Golden Temple, the light was this incredible dark royal blue, which contrasts beautifully with the deep yellow yeah. gold of the temple itself. Um, we didn't get an awful lot of shots because the sun rises very, very quickly. Um, but I'm really happy with the reflections in the water, but also the amount of detail mm -hmm. that we happened to be able to capture on the temple. Um, <laughs> one of the challenges was making sure that the depth of field uh, was where we needed it to be because I really wanted the temple to stand out and I wanted the marble and the background to feel separate and slightly blurred. And again, this is one of those occasions where things did work out really well and we walked away um, incredibly happy with both the experience of the shoot and the photograph itself of the Golden Temple at Sunrise. What's the next? Now, the next photograph we want to share with you is a complete contrast. Um, we don't take an awful lot of wildlife shots, and that's for a few reasons. In the early years, it wasn't possible, largely because... We didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> I'd never taken a photograph in my life. Leaves were taken snapshots, but also wildlife photography, unless you're very, very lucky, or going to a zoo require you to be perhaps a little bit closer than you want to be to lions or tigers. But with this shot, uh, we I think we were incredibly lucky because there are many, many reports where people uh, uh, aim to, to take photographs of an orangutan um, and they just don't show. The orangutans themselves, um, this was actually, so let me give you an idea in terms of what it took to get this shot. Um, we hadn't planned on um, visiting the island of Borneo. Uh, it's not 
easy to get to. Um, it's certainly not uh, cheap to get to. But whilst we were in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, uh, which is an incredible country, uh, we had an offer um, from a local magazine who were interested in bringing motorcycle and photojournalists mm -hmm. on a junket, on a trip. And the invitation was then given to us. And the magazine themselves basically flew Lisa, myself, um, quite a few others, and our motorcycles out to Borneo and then gave us this incredible experience, which included visiting an orangutan sanctuary. Now, the, one of the things that's interesting about the sanctuary is the orangutans are rescued, but they are wild, which means there's no guarantee of actually seeing the orangutans. I think there are, they say at, at the moment, there are about 31 um, wild orangutans um, in this um, national reserve. I think that's the correct term for it. But bearing in mind that globally there's only 64,000 left. And that might sound an awful lot, but it really is And they isn't. are on the uh, extinction list. And if I remember correctly, I picked up, I picked up a second-hand uh, 1 to 400 mil lens. So this was one of the first times I'd actually had um, a large zoom lens. This lens gave us the chance to really get up close and personal because shooting wildlife um, for Lisa and myself is very much like um, photographing people. Um, you want there to be a connection and for that connection to visually happen, you want to photograph their eyes. Um, so with the long lens, uh, even shooting up into the light, we were able to really capture the expression and the life um, of, of this large male older orangutan who was looking right. down going you know <laughs> what are you it doing it was actually quite frightening as, as we approached the area where as people thought we might be um coming along you could hear him but literally a couple of miles away <clears throat> the noise that he made this is as bellowing as noise swinging through the trees and you can see all the trees moving and 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 the people that were with us the, the other motorcyclists on the tour we were all going what on earth is coming through um and then suddenly this Massive, he was huge, to say a big adult male. They can live to about 30 years old, I think, um, even in, in the wild. Um, and I just couldn't believe it. He, he was just there, looming above us and, and looking down on us as though actually he was watching what? us was, rather than the. Oh, that's other a, I just way. compared that exact same line. Because <laughs> yeah, I honestly, to, honestly, to this day, I'm not sure whether he was watching us or vice versa. Um, I think we ended up with. Probably a couple of hundred shots mm. um, from both the cameras, um, and they're all precious. But this particular shot of this incredible animal um, really resonated with Lisa and myself because of the expression on his face. Mm. This incredibly majestic and yet calm and peaceful expression, where he's just looking down at us, and you can't help but wonder, you know, what's What's he thinking? What's his life been like? Probably look at those stupid humans. Um, actually, interesting enough, orangutan in Malay means, orang means man, and the tang is forest, so it's man of the forest. Did you know that? I'm not sure. I go with king of the jungle. <laughs> e e e either way, it was, again, an experience like so many on the trip that we hadn't anticipated, hadn't expected, hadn't ever dreamed that we'd have that kind of opportunity to be that close to a wild orangutan. Um, it's you know we're happy with the photograph. Um, it's it's not a prize winner, but to Lisa and myself, it's very 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 important and precious. Um, what's the next photograph? I have a bit of a difficult time photographing people. Um, you do. I, I do. do. Yeah, Simon does as well, but he, he manages but, to on, be but, great. But by difficult, let's just qualify that. Um, of all the photography and all the images that we shoot, uh, and again. You can, you can let me know if it's different for you. The most challenging type of photography for me is portrait photography. Um, I feel it's, it's very personal, but also when you're photographing somebody, um, you have that dilemma. Do you ask their permission first? Do you, um, do you just take the shot and then perhaps speak to them afterwards? Putting a camera in someone's face or even pointing a camera in someone's direction is very personal. Um, I feel what I'm doing, I feel it's very intrusive, but that's just me. I've got other friends, doesn't phase them at all. Um, but also if you go, and, and we've said this before many times when we've spoken about photography, it, asking someone's permission then changes 
how you catch them, their their reactions, their the way their face changes when they know when somebody knows they're being photographed. You you kind of like a. But the, bot the bottom side. line is whether you whether you're photographing Maasai warrior in Tanzania, um, cartel bosses in Colombia, politicians, um, street beggars, absolutely everybody, almost without exception, poses for the camera. Um, so you don't. So if you've if you've seen someone's expression, if you've seen something special in a person. Um, Perhaps where they're taking a moment to themselves and their minds drifting. It can be totally lost. Not can be. It will. It will be totally lost. So typically, Lisa and I like to use a long lens, capture capture that special portrait, and then normally we'll actually go and have a conversation with that person afterwards, get the permission to use it, to share it, and of course, importantly, share the image you've taken with them which normally ends up stirring up a whole conversation and people typically are delighted. It goes without saying, if they, if they see the photograph and then they ask you not to use it, you have to respect that. However, this one was slightly different, if I remember. The young this boy, was odd. This was a posed photograph. He did know that you were taking the photograph. And the situation, we... we <laughs> When we were in Pakistan, we had a, a military guard with us for the entire time we were there because it was 2009 and it was a very volatile time this was in at Pakistan. The, this was actually at the height of the hunt for Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Now, we, we didn't know that at the time, but from the moment we entered Pakistan to the moment we left, we had two, uh, two vehicles, one in front and one in back. They're, they're um, full of Pakistani armed forces. Special forces, yeah. um, anti-terrorist police, and they escorted us and two of the motorcyclists, hello Alex, hello hello Nico, <laughs> across the entire country, um, which was incredible but also slightly unnerving because occasionally between villages um, or between cities um, there'd be a wide open barren area. The entire convoy would come to a stop. We're, and we don't forget, they're in trucks and we're in Land the Rovers. middle... Uh, on motorcycles, so all four of us. To watch, to watch eight heavily armed, trained soldiers jump out of these vehicles and then all run and scatter in different directions. The very first time it happened, I know the four of us just, looked at each other and go... What do we do? Okay, what do we do? We haven't been given any instructions. Do we just stay on the motorcycles? Uh, is somebody out there? Is there a sniper out there? They've all run away and apparently seemingly hidden, and here we are. Are they out, <laughs> search are they out searching for potential, you know, um, snipers and, and, and... Or are they just hiding? Or are we being set up? And are we now, in fact, in the kill zone? <laughs> you have no idea. So uh, as as it happened, they had had a they report were on the radio that there was something up, and they had gone out looking. Um, but uh, we didn't know that until uh, after the end of the journey. But this this particular photograph. So the military guys that were with us asked us not to photograph them. We managed to get a couple of shots. Um, but this particular photograph um, is incredibly special for Lisa and I, um, because the. The four of us, instructed by the military guards that we had, we would stop every hour, every couple of hours. For tea. For tea. Um, and this was lovely, but after a while it became slightly problematic. Um, you'd stop by the side of the road, um, and this young guy caught our attention for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's very difficult to look at somebody so obviously young who is wearing such a, such a life on his face. I mean, the, the, level, of, the level of wear... Um, anxiety. Uh, we had a brief chat to him. This is a young guy who, from what we can understand, had an incredibly difficult and, dare I say, brutal life. Um, well, I, I, I think you can see that just by looking at his face. Um, he, knew, he knew he was being photographed and there is not an ounce of energy or thought on his part to pose. He just doesn't have it in him to pose for the camera. Um, years earlier, um, I'd been, um, and I hadn't held a camera, I hadn't taken a photograph, I'd been absolutely blown away by what is today one of the most um, highly thought of and one of the most um, well-known covers of National Geographic. It's of a young girl with these incredible eyes in Afghanistan just staring at the photographer. 
And as I was talking to this, this young boy, just for a few moments before we managed to take the photograph, what struck me was the contrast between the amount of dirt and life that was etched into his skin that contrasted with the colour and clarity of his eyes. Um, I mean, I've tried this image at several ratios, you know, cropping in, cropping out, and there's just no way that you can't be held by the stare of, of his eyes. And there's not much more that needs to be said. I think it's important for each person to look at the photographs and to connect and to imagine their own story behind but I think the image. If you, if you notice that, that Simon said there is nothing on his face posing for the photograph, um, and even if there's a hint of a smile, that smile will usually reach the eyes, but there's no, there, there's is, nothing there, there is nothing. Um, the last image we're going to share with you, based on having enough time, um, we, we have we have 1.2 million photographs on hard drives that we carry with us. Um, this particular image, um, I'm not sure whether I can say it was just luck, fate, um, lots of hard work. We, we'd heard of this incredibly high pass um, between the borders of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan called the Kaisal Art Pass. I think it's the second highest border in the world. Um, I think the highest we recorded well, we recorded ourselves at 15,009 feet. Yeah. Um, and Lisa and I had all these grandiose plans of riding our bikes there and having these mountains and taking our time and packing a lunch and a cup of coffee and <laughs> getting the cameras out and really having this incredibly spectacular photo shoot where we were going to take these wonderful images. And it just absolutely Did didn't happen. Did. This particular pass has been used for millennia. Now, that's not a word you get to say very often by... Pilgrims, devotees, tradespeople, Ooh, uh, soldiers, kings. Marco Polo, he used it. You know, so a few famous <laughs> people have been along this track. So getting there was a really big deal for Lisa and myself. We were also very late. The first snows had hit. Um, the yeah, night, we were, it was October. Yeah, the night before yeah. the image, and here's the crux of the story. The night before the image, um, it, was, it was minus 15 and below. So we battled to get all our gear on right up to the pass. Uh, Lisa at this point was suffering pretty severely from altitude sickness um, and that was a real concern. I pull out the camera and there's absolutely nothing happening. Now at that point we had two digital SLRs and video cameras and other bits and pieces. Every single battery on every single camera is dead, utterly killed by the sub-zero temperatures. Now we're stuck because I had this idea, I'm not sure it'll work, but I need to get Lisa down from the altitude as quickly as possible. Because at this point, this is when the GPS is reading 15,009 feet. I pulled all the batteries out from every bag I could find, put the bike on its side, kept it running, and I put the batteries on the cylinder head of my bike on the engine, hoping that the engine's heat wouldn't melt the outer casing of the batteries. The long and the short of it is that by some miracle we managed to get enough heat back into one battery to capture a total of three photographs. Um, and the photograph here that still today remains one of our favourites is one of those images. Um, a number of magazines have used it. Um, I think one of the biggest buzzes that we've had from this image is that for Almost two years before the journey began, uh, the book that we would read at every single opportunity um, was the Adventure, the Adventure Motorcycling Handbook. Hang on one second. <laughs> Sorry about that. By our buddy Chris Scott. And we would pour through this magazine. And a little while after uh, this image was taken, Chris actually emailed us and said, look, I'm looking for a cover for a new, for, for a new edition of my, of my book, The Adventure Motorcycle Handbook. Do you have an image? We sent him a few. I can't tell you how proud we are <laughs> to have Lisa on the front. Now, this is actually the second shot we managed to get after the one we're sharing with you now. But, yeah, the challenges, the challenges of getting into these locations, getting the gear out, fumbling with fingers that you cannot feel, 
sipping on air that's barely filling your lungs. Yeah, um, and that's why that's why some of these images um, really do hold a special place in our hearts. Um, if you'd like to see more of our photography, um, we have our website, toridetheworld.com. The best place to see our favourite images is actually at our online gallery. Which you can which reach is, via the uh, website as well. There's a, yep. a link page there. But if you go to www, and you do need to type those in because it's a redirect. So www.prince, P-R-I-N-T-S, toridetheworld.com. So three W's, prince, toridetheworld.com. There's five galleries. I hope you enjoyed the images. I hope you've enjoyed hearing some of the stories. And we really hope that we can get to see you guys in person in 2021. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. On motorcycles. <laughs> thanks, guys, guys. Thanks, thanks so thank much you. for your time. Bye. Cheers for now.